Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us in our discussion about the economic impact of COVID-19 and its policy implications for developing economies. I'm Ceyla Pazarbaşoğlu, Vice President of the Equitable Growth Finance and Institutions at the World Bank Group. I'm joined by three very distinguished panelists, Dr. Reza Bakir, the Governor of the State Bank of Pakistan, um, and we have uh, Liliana Rojas Suarez, who's a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development and director of the organization's Latin America Initiative. Ishwar Prasad is a senior professor of trade policy at Cornell University. And thank you very much, uh, Liliana Reza and Ishwar, for joining us today. I really look forward to the discussion. We have a large audience from across the world via Facebook, YouTube, World Bank Live. And please do post your questions online and we will respond towards the end of the session. On Monday, we published our Global Economic Prospects Report, as we call it, JEP. It is the World Bank biannual flagship report on the state of the global economy. We forecast that the global economy will see its deepest recession since the Second World War. This recession is the first time since 1870 to be triggered solely by a pandemic, and it is the most synchronized, extraordinary economic contraction with almost all countries across the world impacted. Emerging and developing economies uh, as a group uh, will contract for the first time in 60 years. So we also expect the per capita incomes to decline significantly, which could tip between 70 to 100 million uh, people into extreme poverty. And this is um, really a sobering outlook. Severe recessions has been associated with highly persistent losses in output in developing economies, low levels of capacity, use and uncertainty. These all deter investment and lead to a legacy of obsolete capacity. Long periods of unemployment cause loss of skills, liquidity problems turn into solvency problems and lead into uh, corporate bankruptcies. So it becomes a self-fulfilling uh, process as weaker growth, pro growth prospects discourage investment. And the two key features of the current global recession, the higher likelihood of financial crisis and the severe terms of trade shock to energy exporters actually increase the lasting risk of lasting damage uh, to potential output in many emerging market and developing economies. On top of this, there are other factors that alter economic order as we know it the sharp increase in uncertainty and a potential retreat from global trade and supply linkages. But for us, the most alarming aspect of this COVID-19 crisis is the potential for deeper and long-lasting scars in emerging market and developing economies, and that is due to lack of access to education, nutrition, and health services, and thus the erosion of human capital, which is really critical for sustained and inclusive growth. So the bottom line is um, what we report is that most developing countries entered the crisis with already high vulnerabilities, with record levels of sovereign and corporate debt, and they have been hit by a great shock compounded by spillovers from advanced economies and China, and they have constrained policy space to respond because a lot of that space has been used since the uh, 2008 global financial crisis. So the potential for long lasting deep scars is, is real. So we are calling for extraordinary response at the domestic, regional and global levels to make sure that we can minimize the impact of this extraordinary shock. So this is the topic of our discussion today. What should developing countries do now to limit the harm in the near term as well as in the long term? What are things that policymakers can do to ensure that some good can come out of this crisis. So for those of you joining us now, we have please welcome to this uh, broadcast. I'm here with uh, Dr. Reza Bakir, Liliana Rojas Suarez, and uh, Professor Eshwar Prasad. And we are talking about the economic impact of COVID-19 crisis and what developing countries can do to limit the harm. The harm. Um, I'm going to start with you, Reza. Uh, Pakistan has taken measures focusing on public service delivery to the most vulnerable groups. What have been the challenges in implementing this response and how effective have these measures been? Please go ahead. 
Hello, Jayla. I hope uh, you can see me and thank you for the invitation for the event today. And at the outset, let me also congratulate you and your team for the excellent report, the global economic prospects that has been produced. I um, will comment about some particular sections later on as we come to the forward looking part. I want to begin Jayla by talking a little bit about how Pakistan is a poster child for the havoc that has been caused by COVID-19. Pakistan is a country that in its history has had recurrent economic imbalances. And one that until a couple of years ago was on a downward path of worsening economic uh, indicators. In fall of 2018, after years of problems, a new government took office and under the leadership of our Prime Minister Imran Khan, it began to address decisively those imbalances that were crippling us. And we had to take tough decisions, tough decisions for stabilization. And as you know, such decisions are always hard. They are never that popular, but they are needed when an economy has worsening fiscal and external imbalances. So those decisions were taken. And over the course of 2019, these decisions began to show results when Pakistan has historically often been selling dollars to try to protect its exchange rate after a long time, we were actually buying dollars because of a reversal of flows. Our exports, which had been stagnant for five years, began to grow after a long time, both in terms of trade and in terms of financial flows. Having decisively addressed some of those imbalances, we were beginning to reap the rewards of the stabilization and to bring these rewards to the public and demonstrate that stabilization leads to growth. Then comes COVID. And COVID has robbed us of the story that we were in the midst of telling the world. So that is the broader context that I want to share about how COVID is not only impacting lives, also impacting policy making and it's impacting the broader narrative of those emerging markets who are trying to do the right thing and have been dealt this mother of all external shocks. Now, in response to your question, Jayla, I want to highlight three things that uh, Pakistan has done, particularly with the focus on the vulnerable groups. The first is the Ahsas Emergency Cash Program. This is a program that puts cash directly in the hands of the people. There are no intermediaries. And it targets 12 million families and gives them 12,000 rupees, which is about $75 each. And the total allocation for this is around 900 million US dollars. I think this is one of the largest, one of the fastest cash transfer programs that has ever been implemented. And at the state bank end, we have actively promoted the full cooperation of the banking sector to be able to distribute so much cash in such a short time. That's first. Second is a program that was introduced by the state bank, which offered to all businesses that any business that commits not to lay off its workers can get concessional financing at 3% from a bank for three months to cover its payroll expenses. And that was a scheme, as you know, central banks are being called upon to do an increasingly wide array of measures in these unprecedented times. But we came up with this because we saw that unless we offer some cheap financing, there could be a lot of layoffs. The take up in this scheme is growing every week. And so far, about a million jobs have been protected because of the concessional financing that has been provided to the borrowers. And third and last thing that I want to mention that in our view has helped to bring relief to vulnerable is a program that we introduced 
to extend loan principal repayments of borrowers. And we worked with our banks through the Pakistani Banks Association to get their cooperation to have a presumption that for the borrowers that come and apply to them, there'll be a presumption of extending their principal obligations by one year. It's still a decision of the bank because we did not want to negatively affect the credit culture. But we asked banks that if they decline a certain application, they also have to inform us as a central bank as to the reasons for why they are declining. And such moral suasion is often sufficient. This being to date about three billion US dollars of principal repayments have been extended. This means that three billion dollars of what was going to be an outflow from the balance sheets of households and businesses has been taken forward by a year. And 95% of these beneficiaries, Jela, are small borrowers. These are in microfinance banks and other small financial institutions where the benefit has accrued to those who are perhaps most in need and those who have least buffers available. So I'll stop here with these three measures that we have taken and look forward to the discussion as it moves along. Thank you. Thank you, Reza. These are uh, impressive measures. And uh, when we were in Pakistan, we were there with, uh, with President Malpass and we did um, visit ESAS and uh, it was very impressive, the program and the bank has been a, a big supporter because it's really clear targeted programs to those that are most vulnerable. Liliana, tell us a little bit about Latin America because informality is a big problem in, in uh, Latin America. It's difficult to target uh, that sector and provide support to that sector. What is being done to support firms in the real sector, especially both in the informal and formal sector? Can you tell us uh, the experiences from Latin America, please? Yes, hi, Sheila. Thank you so much for a great uh, report. Uh, uh, it really, I learned a lot from it, so thank you for that. Uh, well, you are absolutely right in the stressing that informality is endemic to Latin America. So much that in some countries, uh, the ratio of informal uh, labor reaches over 70%, including in large economies like Mexico. Um, now, in terms of support, the truth of the matter is that the large amount of the majority of uh, government programs have been directed and are being directed to the formal sector. Uh, they work by providing uh, government gu guarantees so that firms can obtain credit from the formal banking sector. Um, in these cases, the guarantee covers up to uh, 100, very close to 100 of the value of the loans, with loans having a specified term and grace period. Now, there are some efforts in the region to reach the informal sector during the pandemic, but they are small in size and actually suffer from some limitations uh, including lack of transparency um, and clarity. For example, um, in Mexico, there is a program similar to Pakistan in where um, firms that have not laid, up, uh, laid off workers can actually get access to uh, government credit. Um, the rate of the loan uh, varies according to the number of employees of the firm. Now, the program is advertised as having requiring no proof of collateral or any other condition, just the, your word. It's called a solidarity program, your word that you have not laid off workers. Now, however, when firms or uh, individuals go to the relevant web page to apply for the loan, they are required to, ha to have their tax ID number, which means that you have to be in the formal sector. A different example is Colombia, where the government offers guarantees for microenterprises in the informal sector, but the guarantees cover only 60% of the value of the loan. As such, because it's only 60% of the uh, value of the loan, and this sector is quite risky, the uptake by banks to reach these firms have been very low. 
because they see too much risk and not sufficient guarantees. Now, a reason why this is happening in many Latin American countries is because the countries don't have enough fiscal space. And however, in my view, I think it's a mistake looking forward, you know how governments can actually do their programs. It's a mistake to announce programs that are not going to work by design. They raise expectations that are not met. A better way, in my view, is to provide whatever um, uh, support to small informal firms is possible within the budget in a transparent way via grants, not loans. Because you know they're not going to be repaid. So why give the illusion that this is going to be a loan? It needs to be a grant if it's not going to be repaid. This is actually a lesson that goes beyond Latin America. If the informal, small-sized business sector is perceived as too risky, for the formal financial system, and the government wants to help the sector, at this time, do it directly through grants, just as the programs implemented to support individuals, which have been transfers. Um, it will be a government budget line that needs to be transparent since the very beginning. Programs to support individuals have been much more successful, by the way, uh, through vouchers, through transfers, uh, but the constraint in many Latin American countries have been the distribution schemes, since there are large segments of the population without proper identification, and in many cases, governments do not have the capacity um, uh, to implement the delivery of the funds and to make uh, them um, reach those that are intended to receive these, uh, these transfers. So, informality, Sheila, to conclude, is actually hitting like a wall um, uh, as a huge constraint to practically all Latin American countries, even including those that have good macro uh, prospects and uh, numbers. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Liliana, for this. Um, we have been working on this issue at the bank as well, and the programs we have been putting in place to protect livelihoods, if you like, especially for the informal sector, using the social safety net. Um, so transfers to individual individual um, workers uh, and uh, small business owners, because at the end of the day, you want to protect the person, not necessarily their uh, little store, because it's easier for them for, to provide resources in the recovery phase to for accumulating assets again and uh, starting their business. We actually had a very good discussion last week uh, with uh, Raghu and uh, Raghu Rajan and Mohamed Elerian, and similar point was uh, raised by Raghu and really trying to target firms when it's um, when they are good taxpayers at least previously or have good export leading result uh, receipts and really trying to make sure that the small corporate sector remains uh, functioning after uh, after the crisis passes. Ishwar, can you tell us a little bit uh, about China? You are an expert on China. You um, have been looking at this country, analyzing the country for many, many years. Um, and what is your assessment of the measures taken there? And what are some uh, uh, lessons or, or what to do and what not to do for other countries? Thank you, Jela. First of all, let me also congratulate you, Dr. Kose, and the rest of the team for a report that is um, comprehensive, analytically rich, and very sobering um, in virtually every respect. But I think the report does paint um, a relatively realistic picture of the challenges that policymakers in every country face, and China is no exception. Um, as is usual with China, there is some good news and some bad news, and unfortunately, the bad news uh, does dominate at this um, juncture. Now, China did, of course, get hit um, with the virus uh, um, well before other countries and its economy um, took a real beating. The good news is that at least based on some indicators, the Chinese economy does seem to be gradually coming back to life, perhaps ahead of the other major economies. Unfortunately, unlike after the last crisis about a decade ago, the global financial crisis, when China took a hit as well, but it turned into a temporary hit and China turned into a key driver um, of global growth and global demand. That is rather unlikely this time because the um, economy is recovering, uh, 
Um, but the shock to demand has been very large. And as some of your analysis and other analysis indicates, it's likely to be quite persistent given the degree of uncertainty that both households and businesses um, uh, face in that economy. Um, recent indicators um, have been mixed. There are some encouraging signs um, that investment is beginning to come back up, at least uh, public investment. Um, retail sales still remain relatively weak, and that's an indication that consumption demand might take um, um, a while to come back. Um, exports have shown um, a relatively limited strength, although the latest numbers, there are some um, optimistic signs. Um, so external demand clearly is not going to help China out. It has to be domestic uh, demand. Um, and here again, there are some um, promising signs. The CPI um, is showing disinflation. That is, the CPI inflation has been falling, but it is still positive. Uh, but PPI inflation, which is an indication of how the industrial sector is doing, um, is certainly not that promising. Purchasing Managers Index and other indicators of industrial activity do actually look um, relatively decent, but the services sector uh, is not doing well. So it's clearly a very mixed picture. Um, the government has decided um, not to announce a growth target for this year, which I think is not necessarily a bad thing, um, given all the uncertainty and given the fact that the emphasis on headline growth was creating some distortions in the economy. But one question remains, why with uh, um, a relatively uncertain um, uh, period ahead, why the government's stimulus measures have been relatively restrained? Um, and therein lies an interesting story, because after the 2008-2009 crisis, um, what helped China grow, of course, was a massive burst of credit-fueled investment growth. Um, that was uh, um, good for China in the short run, good for global demand in the short run but it created a lot of uh, financial and other uh, systemic risks that China is living with to this day. Um, the Chinese government seems to be taking a very calibrated approach, trying to argue, uh, or at least send out the impression that things are improving, um, that the government will provide support where it needs it, but will not go overboard, um, creating additional medium-term risks. We have seen some monetary policy actions from the People's Bank of China, the PBOC. There have been a few um, reductions in reserve requirements. That is the amount of reserves uh, commercial banks are required to hold with the central bank. There have been some small, um, uh, a number of small uh, cuts to um, policy interest rates. Um, but um, the government, I think, is legitimately concerned that uh, a burst of credit may not go to the parts of eco the economy that really need it. You mentioned small businesses that are still hurting. Um, it may not go to the parts of the economy that would use that money well in terms of productive investments. Um, so the government and the PBOC have gone back to their strategy of trying to use targeted lending programs to get credit to go to the parts of the economy um, that need it, that could generate better employment growth. Um, and likewise, with fiscal policy, the measures have been relatively restrained so far. The government does have room in terms of both monetary and fiscal policy to support the economy further if needed, uh, but it seems to be taking the approach of seeing how far it can go with the measures that are already in place. So I'm a little more optimistic than your team is about the prospects for China. I know that you're projecting a small contraction um, in GDP growth this year. I think given um, where the economy is right now in terms of momentum based on certain indicators, Given that they have some room for stimulus, I think China might register mild positive growth this year without relying very much on external demand. So this could end up being a very tiny net positive for the world economy. But certainly China is not going to be the key driver of global growth. But at the same time, I don't think, unlike the major economies, it's going to be much of a drag either. So as always, some bad news and some good news as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ishwar. Even before the COVID crisis in the previous JEPS and commodity mar market outlook, we were writing about China reducing its demand on commodities and potential implications of this on commodity exporting developing countries. And I think um, with the COVID developments, this is becoming even more of an issue. So even if um, uh, as you say, there's some positive news, it will still have implications in terms of not move, you know, lifting up other countries' 
as it did and as you mentioned during the global financial crisis. What would be really great is um, to talk about some of the long-term consequences of COVID-19 pandemic and what would be policy actions to take because um, I'd like to hear from you how worried you are about the danger of debt and financial crises. We didn't start this crisis in a good position with record levels of debt, both in advanced economies with uh, collateralized loan obligations and so on, as well as um, corporate uh, and uh, sovereign debt in many of the developing economies. So what are the dangers of that? What are the dangers of stagflation or hyperinflation? And what can be done uh, in your view in uh, different countries? So whoever wants to, it's a question for all of you, but whoever wants to start, please. I'll uh, be happy to take a first crack from a country perspective, Jaila, because um, as I shared earlier, we've been struggling with the issues and the challenges that COVID has brought on us. So when you talk about the long-term scars, uh, the global economic prospects has an excellent box that I highly recommend to all the viewers of this webinar on the impact of uh, COVID on potential output. And that points out about a significant long-lasting reduction in potential output for countries. And then it also states that those countries which are more vulnerable are the ones which are going to have the biggest impact on potential output. Now, these are the very same countries that, because they are the most vulnerable, they have the least policy space to respond. If they are vulnerable because they have been running high fiscal deficits, they have the least capacity to give a fiscal stimulus. If they are the most vulnerable because they have had loose monetary policy, they are the most constrained to give a monetary policy response. So if you take that and you put these two together, that means that these are the countries that are going to suffer the most in terms of their living standards. And just as there is an active debate within countries, in the US, in other countries, about the impact of COVID on inequality within countries. I see that the one of the long lasting impacts of COVID at a global level is it's gonna increase global inequality across countries. Now, what can be done and what are the policy responses? Now, because vulnerable countries because they are vulnerable, do not have policy space, it really comes down to in what manner IFIs, international financial institutions, can help them. There are lender of last resorts, and there are institutions like the World Bank and the regional development banks that are there as part of their charter to be available to help in such circumstances. And here I see big challenges. I want to, at the very outset, very much welcome the recent efforts shown by the leadership at the World Bank, by the leadership at the IMF. One example of this is the debt relief initiative that was uh, successfully taken through the G20. And no doubt it's gonna give a considerable relief. But at the same time, I do feel that there is a need for a lot more to be done, particularly in these and other institutions as to how they think about this crisis. Let me give you an, an example. You will recall uh, when I used to be at the IMF, and I think you were there at the same time as well, when Lehman stuck and we had what was then called the global financial crisis. At that time, the IMF changed very significantly, very drastically, I would say, compared to the Asian crisis when the IMF had been calling for cutting fiscal deficits. In the programs that started after the global financial crisis in 2008, for the first time, IMF disbursed money into programs where deficits were rising. The IMF had realized that that did not work. And that was a big change for the IMF culture back then. The IMF introduced a flexible credit line, which had never ever been considered before to have, to have conditionality on an ex-ante basis 
the concept of having countries pre-qualify for credit lines based upon their track record until that time was anathema. Many shareholders previously would never have gone for it. So those were big changes. And I think it is time that we also see more of such big changes in the institutions. And, and it is a time for the institutions to demonstrate leadership because we know that the leadership of these institutions has to take the shareholders on board. I'm going to give you one concrete example where it may be useful to do some rethink. And that is in the traditional frameworks for debt sustainability and country lending limits. Both IMF and World Bank have it. They are good frameworks designed for good, normal circumstances. But I would submit to you that these are exceptional circumstances. These frameworks need to be revisited to think how will these frameworks help to achieve the goal, Jayla, that you mentioned, that we don't want liquidity problems to become solvency problems. And my concern would be that if new ways to think about these issues are not found soon, and considering that vulnerable countries have the biggest loss in potential output, the least space will suffer the deepest recessions, we may miss an opportunity to help such countries come out of the dire circumstances that they face. I can't uh, follow if you want. Uh, all right. Um, uh, well, as you correctly discussed in the report, long-term consequences of the pandemic are going to take many forms. Uh, let me focus on fiscal, on financial issues, since that's what I uh, work on the most. Um, and my concerns go both in the external and the uh, domestic front. On the external issues, I'm deeply concerned about the cascade of sovereign defaults. Uh, last October, this same group, we were talking about the large accumulation of debt, both private and public, of emerging markets and developing countries, and the risks um, that they entail. Now we have the perfect storm because the forecasted deep, rece deep recession and the increased global risk aversion is actually curtailing significantly the sources of external funds for many emerging markets and developing economies. Now, to compound this problem, we have the rating agencies going into a cascade and a lightning speed, they are downgraded um, uh, liabilities from, um, uh, from these countries. Um, many are many countries are actually about to lose their investment uh, grade status, which by itself is going to trigger automatic sales by a number of international pension funds that, by their own uh, in, uh, domestic uh, internal sorry internal rules, need to maintain only um, investment grade assets. So the need for external debt resolution therefore has to be acknowledged at the global level. There are a number of proposals we've been reading and discussing on the table, uh, including the call for a debt standstill, uh, of course, that which means a, su a suspension of payments. Um, we don't have time to discuss the pros and cons um, uh, right now, uh, but a clear issue, in my view, is that there are two factors that need urgent attention. Uh, the first is that there has to be a clear differentiation between countries that have an unsustainable debt trajectory and therefore are in urgent need of debt restructuring and those in which a debt standstill could actually help because it's going to benefit both creditor and debtors. Creditors will receive more and debtors will actually be able to use actual resources for the resolution of the pandemic. On the domestic front, I have another major concern and is the eruption of significant financial crisis in many emerging market economies and developing countries. Um, the first reason, of course, um, and is well recognized in your report, is the expected increase in the non-performing loans associated with the recession. Um, and that could severely um, a weaken financial system. It's impossible at this stage to actually forecast the number of firms that are going to uh, fail but there will be uh, a large number of uh, failures. And so the question is, to what extent firms' liquidity problems are going to uh, uh, end, uh, turn into solvency? 
But a, a very important issue that I really, really want to stress is whether the programs that are being implemented right now could actually, the program for supporting uh, firms and individuals could actually have some effects on the stability of the banking system, which brings a major, major trade-off. So the question is whether the provision of these large government guarantees, another incentive to induce banks to provide credit, is leading to a good allocation of credit. Here's the problem. On the one hand, naturally, government wants banks to lend to minimize the economic contraction. That's totally uh, reasonable. But on the other hand, they also want banks to maintain this, their stability, right? The stability of the financial system needs to be preserved. That, therefore, what is happening right now is that in the presence of high uncertainty and negative outlooks, many sim, uh, some banks simply do not want to lend or lend at a very small scale. On the other hand, there could be financial institutions that are taking more risk right now, lending more. If the economic scenario remains adverse at a time where the loans need to be repaid, meaning six, 12, even in some cases, three years from now, not only the government guarantees would need to be executed, but the size of the bank, bank's portfolios in trouble could be much larger than expected. Ways to mitigate, mitigate this risk, for, risk from my point of view are, one, governments need to recognize that if there is a banking crisis, the resolution would need to be paid with financial res fiscal resources anyway. So it all goes back to the government, to the fiscal resources. That increase supervisory efforts about bank lending practices and stress tests to determine the quality of individual banks is now more needed than, than ever. And finally, if governments are unsure about the quality of the banking sector and or their supervisory quality and capacity, it is essential to seek support from international organizations such as the World Bank to seek technical assistance in the design of alternative vehicles to channelize resources to targeted firms and sectors. Let me end there. Jill, I have just a couple of minor things to add to um, the very rich perspectives that we heard from Reza and from um, uh, Liliana. Um, uh, Reza correctly pointed out these are exceptional times. And one of the things worth keeping in mind is that the traditional adjustment mechanisms that were available to uh, many economies, especially the developing economies, are missing right now, as your report shows, given the very synchronized, uh, deep nature of the recession around the world. Um, there is no, um, you know, uh, escape route for a developing economy, even one with a flexible exchange rate, simply because there is no uh, viable source of external demand to make up for the loss of domestic demand. Um, the other issue that I think um, uh, bears concern as one thinks about the longer term is what the involvement of governments in various parts of the economy is going to do. As uh, Liliana pointed out, um, trying to infuse credit in the economy is receiving some resistance from banks, which I think are behaving um, uh, in a reasonable way commercially. So um, in the advanced economies and in the emerging market economies, you see governments getting more directly involved in the economy. And this is going to create some distortions that last with us for a long time. At an extreme moment like this, those distortions are um, probably second order and not worth uh, uh, worrying about. But this is something we'll have to contend with um, in the future because we're going to be uh, in a situation where economies have enormous amounts of uh, debt. Um, and that debt, especially for emerging market economies, is going to become increasingly complicated to finance. Um, on the positive side, we do have saving rates going up uh, around the world, not necessarily for the right reasons. Um, largely because uncertainty is rising. So both corporate savings and household savings um, uh, are already showing some indications of rising and are likely to continue rising. Um, but whatever savings is coming out is being soaked up by the advanced economies to a very large extent, given the massive expansion in uh, um, government debt uh, in these countries. So where the financing for the developing and emerging uh, economies comes from is going to be a real challenge.
um, and if they do get the financing or can raise it domestically, how well it is allocated is also going to remain a major challenge. Again, these are things that in the heat of the moment perhaps uh, are less of a concern than just getting economies getting restarted. Uh, but there are going to be many long-term consequences we will be dealing with for years to come. That's a that's a great point, Ishwar. And and I think uh, what is going to be important is to also recognize that the actions and the policies taken today will have implications going forward. One of my concerns, and I keep saying this, this started as a health crisis. It became a health and economic crisis. My worry is that it becomes next and health, economic and financial crisis, because as uh, you mentioned, as Liliana mentioned, if the if the money is the limited fiscal space and the monetary space is not used well in transparent ways and communicated properly and action taken if the um, if they are not targeted properly we may end up with uh, much more long-term consequences and to the good recommendations from Liliana I would like to add also of course this is now a human tragedy we are you know countries are dealing with health issues with economic lives and livelihoods are a threat but it's also time to really make sure that the insolvency mechanisms are in place out of court settlement system so so that you know if there are companies that run into problems this can be handled quickly so that they can um, uh, continue their business and that the banking system does not uh, suffer at the end because at the end all ends up in government balance sheet right so that is going to be very important and i want to underline transparency um, you mentioned the debt suspension initiative um, reza this is a, a very important initiative um, we have been working very closely with the imf with the g20 and others and and really a key part of this uh, initiative is debt transparency, investment transparency, because the countries that will benefit during the recovery phase are the ones that I think will be the ones that are transparent and show that um, they are taking the right measures in terms of um, uh, getting good debt and using debt wisely in, in good investments. And I would um, like to, um, move our discussion. One thing to mention, Eshwar, um, you mentioned that uh, our China projection, it's 1% for growth in China this year. We are projecting, um, we are projecting negative growth only for um, uh, the downside scenario. So it's the only major economy with positive growth this year, although of course compared to earlier um, growth in China, this is quite anemic and as you said, it's not going to help bring the rest of the developing economies um, out of the difficult situation. I think what I would like to um, use the uh, next uh, 10 minutes or so is um, to ask you briefly talk about some of the measures that can be taken to help countries to re recover better. What are some, um, you mentioned the role of the public, uh, increased role of government. So, you know, potentially we may see more state-owned enterprises. So how does one uh, deal with the distortions this may cause and and, uh, and have some sort of a sunset clause and, and get out of them? Digital is an important, digital connectivity is clearly showing us, this crisis is showing us that this is very important and it's going to be more important going forward. What can be done in that uh, space? Energy sector reforms, given the low level of oil prices, you know, this is an opportunity to really move to a more sustainable energy, but also uh, reduce some of the distortion. So I would love to hear from all of you in terms of what you think are key um, it's hard to talk about reforms when you're in the middle of a crisis, I take it. But on the other hand, these are going to set the stage for the next, uh, for the recovery. So what are feasible actions that can be taken to recover better? You want to start, Ishwar? Um, so in the context of, um, yeah, let me take the China specific um, um, angle here. Uh, China was in the midst of um, a growth rebalancing, um, a sort of semi-financial sector restructuring. Um, both of those have been put on hold given the present circumstances, but clearly the government is not uh, uh, completely backing away. 
uh, from worrying about financial system risks. Um, echoing the comments from uh, uh, Liliana and Reza, I think um, there is going to be uh, not just a requirement for well-targeted policies in the coming months, but also a sense um, of where the medium-term risks might be that uh, emanate from these policies. Now, the difficulty is that for a command economy such as China, making a course correction midstream is going to be very um, difficult, but I think they're doing the right thing um, in terms of restraining um, stimulus until they can get a reasonable sense that it goes to the right parts of the economy. But there are other economies, such as India, again, that face um, uh, uh, difficulties. Um, uh, India was slowing down even before uh, COVID hit. There were financial system stresses um, that were holding back credit growth and investment growth. Um, so this is not quite a time to uh, pull back um, on banking sector reforms. I think um, while there might be some forbearance on issues like capital requirements and so on, um, it's going to be quite difficult, of course, to raise capital at this stage. I think the fundamental change that governments can start thinking about and pushing forward is really changing incentives, um, especially in the banking system and the financial system more broadly. Um, so this is a difficult time, but trying to use it wisely um, in order to un start uh, creating momentum towards those more fundamental changes that are going to be required in any case and would mitigate any negative long-term impact the measures being taken now is, uh, I think, the right approach. Now, those are easy words to say, but of course, it depends crucially on the country-specific context about how that is implemented. I'd like to go ahead, Reza, your thoughts. Uh, thank you, Jayla. So I think uh, there's a whole host of measures that could be considered. Uh, let me start with uh, one example. I mentioned to you the example of targeted cash transfers. And I was sharing with you the example from Pakistan. I'm sure there are many other countries that have been doing this as well. Now, you know, one very simple thing to be done for countries where there are high debt levels such that such transfers cannot be financed domestically, yet there's a need to do more, is IFIs could come out with just a overall policy that they're going to fully fund these. And Liliana also mentioned how cash transfers directly to households work well. Yela, you mentioned how you were impressed with the SR's cash program. So one very concrete measure is let's increase that to higher amounts. We've done so much. Let's do another amount financed by the World Bank. That will put money directly into the hands. That's one concrete example. There are some others as well. But I want to come back to a point that I alluded to earlier, which is that such ideas will run into the problem of country limits that lending institutions have. And this is the time where there is a need to rethink whether some targeted relaxation of that is going to produce more benefits than risks. And you should admit that there are risks. There may be some problems of targeting. But in a situation like this, when in countries, countries are unfolding programs and schemes which are not very well targeted. You've heard of some advanced economies where some very rich businesses got a grant, benefited from a federal program that was designed only for those who were very needy. So if some of that happens across countries, it's not the end of the world. And at the end of the world, and you know, at the very end, if some countries get additional concessional assistance from lending agencies, and it turns out that they eventually get into debt distress, and some of that money needs to be restructured, that too is not the end of the world. HIPIC, the, the heavily indebted poor countries initiative that was considered very successful. You know, at the end of the day, according to World Bank figures, costed the world economy only 0.1% of GDP or less than that, actually. And my point here is that there is a need right now to be more ambitious in terms of how those countries that are vulnerable can be supported for those programs that international financial institutions have said themselves have worked well. 
And, and at the time like this, when countries cannot finance it themselves, that's a big intervention that can help. I have a, a question which is coming online as well, um, which relates to what you said. So the bank is increasing um, its uh, support to many countries, so especially through uh, social safety nets and, and cash transfer programs and, and so on. And I take the point and we have, we have been working and we are working on looking at what can we do more. Um, in many countries, uh, given the constraints you mentioned. In terms of the cash transfers, so the one question that comes online, and I've heard this many times, is how do you prevent that these are well targeted, that they go to the right recipients and they are not misappropriated? I know there was quite a lot of work in SS on this, so maybe perhaps you could tell us uh, from your experience. Certainly. So the SAS program runs on the uh, NADRA database, which is the national database of people's identity cards and their and their family information. And then it has a series of questions that tries to eliminate uh, those beneficiaries who should not be benefiting from it. Some examples of those questions are whether uh, that person or a member in that family, because we have family tree data as, as well, may have gone on a trip abroad or if they have a asset like a car purchase or some other such uh, questions which can help to eliminate some of those people who may not need such a cash transfer. And I think by general counts and the, the, the targeting overall in SAS has been quite good. And it has been expanded over a existing uh, program that was already rated quite highly by international institutions like the World Bank. Nevertheless, when you do something so ambitious in such a short time frame, there will be a little bit of leakage. And I want to come back to my earlier point that, that, that we have to recognize at the level that there will be, and recognize that we are working in the second, third best world. We do not have the time to create the most perfect system. And if there is some leakage, it is well worth the cost that at least we are being able to reach mostly deserving families. It is critical, Jela. Lockdowns are a luxury of the rich. Countries like Pakistan cannot afford them. And in such circumstances, when households are already suffering, even if there is some leakage in targeting, it's still well worth the benefit to those who will will genuinely benefit from it. Agreed, and I think um, the the key is to then try to improve the system as uh, as one goes along. And uh, this is extraordinary crisis, and the impact has been so extraordinary and really requires um, extraordinary measures. But, I, but we have also been, you know, we have projects all over the world and there are many ways of also exposed self-correcting and making sure that the uh, funds do go to where it needs to, where, where they need to go. But I take it, this is a, a very difficult time. Um, question for you, Liliana, I can, uh, in terms of both the long-term um, uh, policies that can be taken, including um, opportunities to address climate change. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Well, um, in terms of opportunities, there is no question that a crisis are the best opportunities for reform. Uh, you know, there has been absolutely so many initiatives that have been on reforms that have been postponed for so long. Um, and now this crisis is actually bringing to the surface the fact, the need for those reforms. Uh, let me mention a couple of ones and then I'll address uh, climate change. Um, but the first one is certainly a very short one, a short term one, which everybody ha by now has mentioned, and is the imperative necessity to get ready uh, for the potential failures of firms and banks in the economy. This is going to happen. It's not something that we can't, uh, you know, just keep it to the future. Get ready now. We don't know what's going to happen, so get ready for that. Um, the second one is that, well, I've been talking at the very beginning about informality, 
and how it had caused so many people um, uh, the, the problems in actually accessing funds. Well, you mentioned digitalization, and I think the opportunity now for improving financial inclusion is here now too. Because, you know, at least from the demand side, a large segment of the population have actually realized how costly it has been not to have access to digital financial inclusion. And so the opportunity is here now, and this could actually, the crisis could actually um, uh, take away the, the mindset constraint result, resulting from the large preference for cash by large segments of the population. So that could be relaxed. Um, on climate change, that is a, a, a more difficult issue, right? Because um, people are kind of have put that on the side uh, for a very long time. And now nobody is talking so much about climate change. But at the same time, there is now this conception that, OK, the world is different. And uh, many of the things that we would not prevent that were going to happen, including the pandemic, including uh, the amount of resources that we were supposed to allocate to health systems. Things that people have been talking as possibilities that may happen, but did not actually materialize, actually do happen. So the awareness of climate change is actually, could actually be in a, take the, have the opportunity to actually raise much more uh, because now those things that people are, were actually ignoring as an event that may or may not happen, actually the current circumstances prove that they actually can be very much a very harsh reality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eliana. And I'm afraid we have uh, run out of time. This was a very, very rich discussion and uh, I wish we had uh, more time. I, we, I tried to answer most of the questions that came online um, with uh, all our panelists. One issue that was also raised is, um, a question that was raised is how can uh, Country, developing countries ensure that liquidity is maintained without raising taxes? Is it wise for state-owned enterprises to be temporarily privatized? We don't have uh, much time to discuss this, but it links to what I want to say as, as closing, which is that, I mean, you heard from all of our three very distinguished panelists, this is extraordinary crisis. It cannot be business as usual going forward. It cannot be business as usual for IFIs as was mentioned by Dr. Bakir, it, was, it cannot be business as usual for the countries and we need to, and it cannot be business as usual for the global community. So we really need to take the right steps and address some of the distortions uh, that we had been dealing with already prior to the crisis, like inequality, growing inequality, and the implications of this, like the um, all the adverse weather effects and implications on growth, human capital. So these are all issues, problems that we had even with before COVID. And I think COVID, um, uh, the crisis, if we can take the crisis, the opportunity part of the uh, of every crisis, really uh, use this to break some of the taboos and to break some of the political vested interests and so on, and try to make as much as possible the reforms that can be put in place, including uh, removing some of the uh, distortions that allow countries to grow and allocate resources more effectively and to uh, lift up the poor. Uh, these will be the priorities for us at the World Bank to work on, and I look forward to um, working together with the distinguished panelists uh, in this uh, call. They are, uh, you know, really very effective in their own areas in promoting uh, good change. And so I would like to end with an optimistic uh, tone, even though the uh, report is very sobering, but I do think we cannot just not do, but really take the measures that are necessary, as I said before, at the national, regional, and global levels. Thank you so much um, uh, for listening to this podcast. And thank you so much, uh, Reza Ishwar, for being with us. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.